My name is Donnie Jardine. I'm the manager of the Medicaid Transformation Team for the Health Systems Division in the Oregon Health Authority. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the 1915I Home and Community Based Services, or HCBS, state plan option. I'd like to point out here that Oregon does have overarching Oregon administrative rules for the 1915I Home and Community Based Services Program. Those rules can be found in Chapter 410, Division 173. We've also linked those rules here for your convenience and easy one click away. We do have a Home and Community Based Services website, a main page, sub page, and informational page for those. These are all linked to this page for your convenience. You can also find our pages by looking at Oregon HCBS or HCBS Oregon on any web search tool like Google or Safari or Chrome or whatnot. The purpose of the 1915I is to ensure that individuals are receiving their appropriate mental health services that they are entitled to in order to increase their independence, empowerment, dignity, and their human potential. We are here to ensure that people's choices and needs are driving the services and their supports. We also want to ensure that people's engagements are meaningful to that individual rather than just engaging in services because that was what they were presented. The 1950 and I does help to improve individuals' access to the greater community, and we want to ensure that that access is to the same degree that you and I or any other individual who may not be accessing HCBS supports and services to remain independent in our home and community. There are three distinct services in the 1959 state plan option, and those are home-based habilitation, behavioral rehabilitation and psychosocial rehabilitation. The first one of these, home-based rehabilitation, we'll focus on now. These are provided in a face-to-face -face manner as described in the person-centered service plan. We will be describing and talking about the person-centered service plan in another webinar, so please tune in for that one. But home-based rehabilitation does provide assistance with activities for daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. And activities for daily living are those personal and functional activities required by an individual for continued well being that are essential for health and safety. And those include eating, dressing, grooming, bathing, personal hygiene, mobility, and the like. And the instrumental activities for daily living are self management activities performed by an individual on a day to day basis. These are not essential to the basic self care and independent living. And these include the housekeeping and laundry, shopping, transportation, medication management, and meal preparation. Additionally, home-based rehabilitation does help with these, provide assistance with these other vital areas of navigating the community, independent living skills, social skills, self-advocacy skills, and other skills to help main, lead to as much independence as possible. And I just wanted to focus this that these services are all delivered in the scope, duration, and amount that are consistent and described in that person centered service plan. Home based stabilization should include a backup plan that's identified in the PCSP. And that backup plan needs to include those paid and natural supports, non paid supports, who are able to help the individual when their primary provider is not able to deliver service for whatever that reason may be. The backup plan will identify any health and safety concerns to the, the individual and other people who interact with the individual, including other uh, community members. And this home-based rehabilitation service can be delivered in a variety of different places, which include the community, um, their own home in which they live in, an adult foster home setting, residential treatment, facility or residential treatment home. And we have a list of providers who are able to offer this home-based habilitation service. These are the adult foster home providers, providers who work in the residential treatment homes, residential treatment facilities. 
a qualified mental health professional or QMHP, a qualified mental health associate or a QMHA, a recovery assistant, peer support specialist, or mental health intern. We're going to turn the page to HCBS Behavioral Habilitation Services. These are designed to help assist and to support individuals to maintain, learn, or improve the skills and functioning in their ADLs and IADLs uh, due to their behavioral health conditions. We want to ensure that providers are actively working with members to reintegrate those lost skills as a result of that behavioral health condition. These services include a bit more like behavioral supports, training and education, and their psychosocial skills and any activity therapies. Um, the services are consistent with evidence-based and evidence-informed practices, and again, as described on the person-centered service plan. Like home-based habilitation, these services are delivered in the, in the same settings, the community, within their own home, the adult foster home, residential treatment home, and facility. And these are provided by the same provider types, as you can see, as the home-based habilitation services. We'll jump over to our psychosocial rehabilitation services. These uh, services are intended to help individuals to compensate or eliminate functional deficits um, that they may have experienced based on or due to their mental illness. These services are identified and agreed on through the person-centered service plan. And by agreed upon, we mean that there is signed informed consent that the individual or their decision-making authority has given the provider to allow for these services to not only begin, but to continue. Uh, TSR services are in place to help support the desires and goals of the individual. We want the individuals to be as independent as possible and sometimes, and these services are there to help that person achieve that independence. We want to reduce the individual's need for assistance from another person as much as possible and maintain their health and safety as well as the health and safety of other people that they are interacting with in the home and in their community. PSR services are provided face-to-face, -face. and here is a list of the services that that encapsulate PSR. So um, medication services, these need to be prescribed and monitored by a licensed medical practitioner. These include individual therapies and group therapies, any family therapies that uh, needs that have been assessed, psychiatric skills training, any behavioral health counseling and therapy, psychiatric activity therapy, or community psychiatric supportive therapy, and assertive community treatment. Again, these services are also consistent with the evidence-based or evidence-informed practice, and they are provided in the way that's described on the person-centered service plan. TSR services are also provided in all of the following of all of the settings that are appropriate for both home-based habilitation and behavioral, HCBS behavioral habilitation services as well. There are a few differences in the provider type who are able to offer psychosocial rehabilitation services. Um, the qualified providers are the QMHP, the QMHA, a certified peer support specialist and a mental health intern. Come back to eligibility for the 1915 IHCBS state plan um, option. An individual must be enrolled in Title 19 Medicaid. So that's when we talk about enrollment in Medicaid, that's when we talk about financial eligibility. They must be financially eligible, which is determined by the Department of Human Services. They have to be 21 years of age or older. They do need to be diagnosed with a chronic mental illness, and they require assistance in two IADLs, um, which are deficits due to the symptoms of their behavioral health condition, and it requires 
the provision of one or more 1959 service at least monthly. By monthly, we're talking about they need to, they need to utilize the 1959 service, one of the three services, every 30 days to maintain the eligibility for the 1915i option. 1915i eligibility, the independent qualified agent or the IQA establishes that eligibility using a functional needs assessment um, and it's through a face-to-face -face contact with the individual. Um, the IQA who's completing the functional needs assessment needs to meet the minimum of the QMHP qualifications. An individual is eligible to be reevaluated uh, in three different ways. The first way is every 12 months, so they need to be having an evaluation completed face to face every 365 days. The individual or their legal representative can request a reevaluation if the needs have changed, or if a provider has documentation that indicates that the individual's circumstances or needs have changed significantly. Those are the three ways that they can be reevaluated. If an individual is determined ineligible for 1959 services, a notice of decision must be given to the individual and the representative. Um, and this, this notice of decision also needs to have their hearing rights explained to them in a way that is understandable and in plain language. So this is a written notice given to the individuals prior to the benefits being terminated. This is an opportunity as well for individuals to be assessed for the state plan personal care services, also known as the PC20 program. Uh, these state plan personal care services are a personal care service offered through the state plan and it is offered at 277 hours annually. Functional needs assessment completed face to face with the individual who is applying for the 1959 service. The individual's representative, if they have one, or legal representative, they can choose to have a representative with them. And also needs the IQA also needs to consult other individuals who have been chosen by the, the member applying for services. The functional needs assessment is used to determine their need, the individual's need for ADLs and IADLs. And we really want to find out how the current state of the individual and how they're functioning now. Historical information is, is fantastic and always needed, but the how the individual is functioning during the 30 days prior to the assessment date and how the, the assessor believes that individual will function 30 days following assessment date is the information that we're really trying to get here. If the individual's needs change within a certain amount of time, as we said, significant documented change, we are able to reevaluate that member at that time. We do use two standardized assessment tools for our functional needs assessment, we have the level of care utilization system, the LOCUS, and the level of service inquiry. And again, this slide really gets to the point of when an individual can be reassessed. So every 365 days, uh, we want to make sure that it's not earlier than 60 days prior to the expiration of the current person-centered plan. So we want that current functioning level and their current needs, pardon me. Um, if their individual would like a reassessment for whatever reason or their legal representative is advocating for that reassessment or when the provider can show uh, documentation about the individual's needs and how the circumstances have changed significantly, which would result in a reassessment in order to determine where that current functioning level is for the person. Switching gears to prior authorization, all 1915 I services must be prior authorized. The functional needs assessment 
that we just spoke about will satisfy the authorization, prior authorization requirements for home-based habilitation and, and behavior, HCBS behavioral habilitation. However, psychosocial rehabilitation services must be deemed medically appropriate by a QMHP or the equivalent of a QMHP. And psychosocial prior authorization does not, this medically appropriateness does not exceed 12 months. They do need to be evaluated for the medically appropriate services every 12 months. So there are a number of doc required documentations that the PSR services shall support those individual needs. And those are listed here. A cover sheet detailing the relevant provider and the recipient Medicaid numbers a requested date of services, the HICPICS or CPT procedural codes requested for the service, the amount of service or units that are being requested, the behavioral health assessment and the service plan meeting requirements as described in this Oregon Administrative Rule 309, Division 019, Section 01 through 5, and any additional clinical information that supports medical justification for any of the services requested. So the IQA, Independent Qualified Agent, is not able to authorize any of the requests if the request is incomplete. Um, there's an inappropriate or unlicensed provider listed. Um, if the individual is not Medicaid eligible, if the individual lacks or the providers lacks any supporting documentation uh, which would indicate medical appropriateness or if the service is not compliant with the Medicaid um, service rules as is outlined in OER 410, 120, 1260 through 1860. So there is an opportunity for authorization to be for payment to be given past the due date of service if the member is determined retroactively eligible. Um, services provided were compliant with the uh, appropriate Oregon rules, or if the request is and the request has to be received within 90 days. Services outside of the 90 days do require additional documentation from the provider, which proves that the, the that the provider was unable to obtain any authorization within the the, this, the initial 90 days of the data service. So, prior authorization payments for prior authorized services are valid. Um, up to 12 months from the date of service. So the providers can still bill for that service up to 12 months and receive payment for it. The prior authorization for 1915I services ends when the individual is no longer 1915I eligible. And compliance for on prior authorizations will be monitored through retrospective review and utilization management. Providers need to meet all of the necessary provider qualifications and be enrolled as a qualified Medicaid provider through the Health Systems Division Provider Enrollment Unit. As long as the services meet the recipient's assessed needs as determined by the functional needs and they're documented in the person-centered service plan. The IQA can authorize payments for the 1959 service. And with other, all other things we do as far as compliance review, utilization management, retrospective review, and the like, um, the Health Systems Division or the IQA can request any additional documentation from the provider to determine that medical appropriateness. So this slide tells us about how we can get more information about the HCBS rules. We do have the links in the first part of this presentation to the Home and Community Base main page, subpage, and additional information page. 
This is where you'll find the statewide transition plan, the home and community-based services facts and information sheet, any frequently asked questions that we have published regarding home and community-based services, and we'll also provide links to the federal rules, the cms.gov webpage, and any ITA webinar and training sites. If you have questions, comments, concerns, please contact us at fss.bh at dhs.oha.state.or.us. I think I put an extra dot in there, so that is fss.bh at dhsoha.state.or.us. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time today, and please do reach out to us with any questions you may have.